Welcome to Common Sense Defense. Um, this is uh, episode seven. And in this episode of Common Sense Defense, we'll be discussing the importance of placing a five-year freeze on decommissioning ships. I will also cover various components and costs associated with decommissioning ships, along with the impact on the overall na naval battle force. Uh, my name is Ptolemy Pruden. I'll be your host today, and uh, let's get right into it. Uh, I have a piece here from the U.S. Naval Institute um, magazine, of Proceedings, which we all know and love. And in this uh, piece, it's, uh, it's the title, How to Decommission a Warship. And this is by uh, Com uh, Commander Sean R. Callahan. Um, and his piece has got about six or seven points I want to go through about how he, the process that he went through and, and just how he talked about it. But um, so when a ship is decommissioned, um, it says Naval Sea Systems Commands, uh, Nav Seas Inactive Ships Office manages the inactive uh, inactivation storage and disposal of all conventionally powered naval ships. Uh, it says, um, the second point is that the decommissioning pre uh, preparations were structured around two maintenance availabilities. The maintenance availability is where um, a ship is getting work done on it, so it's called the availability, like, the, like there's space available for you to get into uh, a, a dock, and so that is called a maintenance availability. Um, the first availability focused on the removal of high-priority equipment and then the second availability involved depot level work. Um, so he's, he goes on and talks about how there's a there's always a, a decommissioning uh, ceremony. And um, after inspecting each space to ensure uh, compliance with inactivation of core crimes, the inactive ship's office assumes custody uh, of the ship at that time. And um, then finally, he says, um, so th there are other issues that you got to consider in deactivating a ship uh, or, or decommissioning a ship. Uh, there's this crew expectation, so there's always um, a period of time that the crew's still on board. And so they um, kind of are working their way out of the, the ship as they take different pieces out, different parts of uh, away from the ship. And then they have a decommissioning date that's set. And so the manning, um, the ship's manning goes down the, the, um, per uh, as they start taking pieces away, people get reassigned to different places. So the manning of the ship changes as well. Now, along with the watch requirements and habitability, the more they take away uh, from the ship, the ship become, becomes less habitable. And so uh, I think what they also do is put together, uh, um, uh, they, they, they have to sometimes have to store or place the um, equipment off in one, one spot, and then they also have to sleep in a different spot. A berthing ship comes alongside, and they, um, and they sleep on that, um, also sleep in the berthing uh, ship as well. Uh, so then they go ahead and they take out network, uh, decommission the networks and the computers. They get they get rid of all the equipment and disposal. All inactive equipment maintenance is, is taken care of. And finally, um, history and ships artifacts. If you have a ship that's been around for 30, 40 years, I mean, they've accomplished a lot of successes and different things. And so those pieces are all um, put away for his, uh, historical factors. It belongs to the United States government. Some people try to take it with them, but that stuff stays with the United States government. And then finally, there has, they have the decommissioning ceremony. Um, so here's a part that I want to read. He says, uh, one of the most common questions I get asked is, what happens to a ship after, after it decommissions? Uh, the answer is that it depends. Some are sold to other navies through the foreign military sales process. Um, these may require a higher level of uh, preservation and attention to material uh, condition during the decommissioning process. Um, some ships are designed, uh, sh some ships are designated for weapons and survivability testing, which is really called a, sink ex a sinking exercise. And a small number may be donated as future museum ships to interest, interested organizations. All of the ships are eventually sold for dismantling and scrapping. So basically, in essence, it's final after that point. And then finally, the other point, the point that I want to share out of, out of this uh, piece uh, as far as what happens to a decommissioned ship is, he says, um, in part, um, there's an uncertainty. This uncertainty results from congressional involvement. Sometimes when they, sometimes in the decommissioning process, I'm, I'm saying this myself, sometimes in the decommissioning process, Congress gets involved. And so that's what he wants to talk about at the section here. He says, this is section two. He says, in part, this uncertainty results from congressional involvement in, in the decommissioning pro decision. Congress must approve ship inactivations and has often disagreed with the Navy's plans in, re in the recent past. Um, examples include the USS Harry Truman is a CV, uh, CVN-75 uh, in 2019, the USS Fort Worth, LCS-3 in the Coronado um, in, in 2020, um, 
um, and the most recent debate regarding the Navy's intention to decommission seven cruisers and four littoral combat ships in fiscal year 2022, which is ongoing right now, which is one of the reasons we are having this topic and conversation in common sense defense. So, okay, so let's let's look at this. So that's just quickly a thumbnail sketch of what happens when you decommission ship. Those are the types of things that happen. Um, so I want to go back briefly to um, to the uh, subtitle C and enable vessel things in the nap um, in the um, National Defense Authorization Act. And so there's a part that I want to kind of piggyback or get back on. And this is in Section 1025 um, about um, about it's called the prohibition on retirement on certain naval vessels. And particularly in this, I want to cite the component that the the, the House and uh, the House and Senate. Um, are, are addressing as it deals with um, decommissioning ships and their attempt to cut those numbers back from 24 and whittle those down. And so my proposal is for there to be a five-year, for them to be placing a five-year freeze on decommissioning ships. And that's kind of what I want to talk about. And I'm using the things that the that Congress is already talking about in conference as the foundation to my argument. So it says in, in the last part of this uh, section C, it says, the budget request proposed retiring five Ticonderoga class cruisers over the next five years, including one cruiser in fiscal year 2023, which will uh, complete extended modernization periods in fiscal year 2023 or 2024. The committee finds this unacceptable. The committee understands each of these ships has received in excess of $500 million to complete, this, to complete the current modernization period with a total of $3 billion obligated on these three ships through September the 30th, 2021. Work completed on these modernizations range from 57% to 93%. The Navy, the, the Navy estimates that $407 million in total additional funding is required to complete the modernization of these ships and return all five to the fleet. The committee also notes previous Navy officials have testified that this extended modernization program would result in some of the most capable surface com combatants in the Navy with an extended 40 year service life, 40 year service life. Okay. So what Congress is saying is, Hey, don't decommission ships that you already have in the birthing that are already in, in uh, that are being worked on through maintenance availabilities. And you're projected to have those out and you're going to cancel these five ships when you already put hundreds of millions of dollars in it. The Congress itself is saying, this is, unacceptable. This committee finds this unacceptable. Next section I want to read out. It says, um, accordingly, consistent with several years of Navy plans and budget requests, as well as congressional authorizations and appropriations, the committee believes the Navy should complete the extended modernization program on each of these five cruisers, return the ships to service, and achieve a 40-year service life. Okay, so Bottom line is, they're like, don't decommission those ships, put them to work so they can work in our national defense. And the next section I want to talk about is the same, same kind of piece here. It says, overall, the committee recommends retaining 12 of the 16 ships proposed for divestment prior to the ESL to better support the national defense strategy, enable additional capability development and experimentation, and be better positioned to realize the policy of the United States to achieve a 355 ship Navy as soon as as soon as practicable. So basically they're 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 putting their feet down saying look you can't just you can't decommission all these ships and that is the total truth. So the Senate committee is saying that the House committee said that in some regards and and everybody else who is a taxpayer should be saying the same thing don't waste money because those ships have to be replaced those ships are currently being, being utilized, and they 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 have they have plenty of life left in them. So a five year freeze on decommissioned ships um, until an operational plan is is in place. That's what I'm asking. That's what I think that um, our our legislators should be looking at is a five year freeze. Because if we don't have a five year freeze, then they're just going to continue to to decommission ships, get them off off off, off of our um rolls and on uh, rolls, and then we're sitting in a situation where uh, we don't have enough battle force ships to do our, our national bidding. So the key point that I want, the key takeaway that I have for our, the first point is this five-year freeze. And that is the, the time, the place is right now to be able to, to be pushing for that. And if we cannot uh, see the importance of that, 
if it, if each Congress person can't see the importance of that, then we all have a problem. But clearly, through their statements, they understand the problem. They understand that something has to be done. So I think, therefore, that there's there's plenty of ground here for us to build off of. Um, so I want to make sure that everyone knows that we are um, we're trying our best to, to put together some pieces in place so that we can build our navy. And it's up to um, it's up to each individual a person to see the importance of that from one end of the spectrum to the other, from the the, the designers of, of, our, of our platforms and the men and women who design our ships to the men and women who build our ships to the men and women who serve on our ships. From one spectrum, end of the spectrum to the other spectrum, we have to um, we have to um, all work together to say, you know, there, you know what, there needs to be a freeze on decommissioning these ships. And I think if we can all um, get on the same page from a national defense strategy perspective and get on the same page, I really believe that um, our Navy and our, our military will be stronger. So that's um, really kind of what I wanted to talk about, um, about the five-year freeze. And then we'll have a, we have multiple uh, podcasts coming behind us that will go through each one of those points in the uh, build our navy camp and they build our navy um, campaign. Um, the first one was was put in place in the five year freeze. So tune into the next podcast. We'll go to our, our for our, to our next uh, phase, and um, I look forward to talking to you then. And you have a great day and be strong out there.